Um, uh, thank you very much. Let me um, begin um, by reciprocating some thanks. Um, I'd like to thank the Deutsche Historic Historisch Institute here in Rome um, for hosting this excellent conference and to Ma uh, Martin Bouch and to Gerrit Schenk for involving me in it and the invitation to give this, this lecture. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the um, support of the Wissenschaftskollege zu Berlin, which gave me a fellowship in 2010 to 11, where I began um, work on the, the, the project, which is now almost at, at completion. Um, and, um, and I'd also like to acknowledge a major British publishing institution, Cambridge University Press, who at the time that I got the fellowship in Berlin gave me a contract to write a rather different book from that that I've ended up writing, as Richard Hoffman will testify. He saw my original proposal, which was rather narrowly British, and I've now ended up writing a volume with um, rather inadvisedly the word world in it. This, I think, is to uh, placate Michael Watson in Cambridge University Press and boost sales. It'll probably bring all kinds of criticism from reviewers down, down upon me. But, I, but I, I might, I'm now thinking, I hope, well outside of the, of the British bo box. Um, um, this is the book that I've been engaged on writing, um, The Great Transition, Climate, Disease and Society in the Late Medieval World, um, and that's going to be published early in, in April. And I mention it, well, partly out of promotional <laughs> purposes, <laughs> um, but I mention it also because in most of the ensuing slides, and there will be a lot of them, uh, this is ordeal by, by graph, this, this lecture, um, in most of the slides, the source that I give is Campbell 2016. I should uh, hasten to emphasize that is not because the data that I'm drawing upon in most cases has been gathered by myself. In most of the cases, it has not. Um, but the sources of the data, the methods by which I've used and uh, combined the data are all given in that book. Um, so if you want to follow up on my material, you will find a very, very long and full bibliography, and each figure has its sources and explanations. I would need double the number of slides tonight to include that information along with the, along with the figures. Now, this is the program of the conference that we've all been enjoying so much over the last um, two days. And um, it was interesting to me when I saw it how um, most of the speakers and proposers of papers had interpreted the word environment. And the bulk of the papers interpret the word environment in, in a physical way in terms of the climatic environment. And we've had a lot of discussion about climate, climate change, the weather, and, and, and so forth. Insofar as other aspects of the environment come in, they tended to come in um, rather sideways, rather obliquely. Um, uh, and there's a big omission. To me, the single most important environmental event in the 14th century is this one. This is the elephant in the room, uh, which I intend to talk about this evening, the Black Death. The single most important environmental event in the 14th century and one of the single most important environmental events of the last 1,000 years. Uh, and I don't see how you can think or talk about the 14th century without um, uh, acknowledging uh, um, the importance of this, of this event. Um, and before I come to the Black Death itself, however, let me set it in its um, climatic and societal um, context. Um, beginning with, with climate change, and very early on in our discussions, George Lutterbacher gave us um, a definition of climate change. It could be a change in averages, uh, average levels of rainfall or temperatures. It could be um, a change in trends. Uh, it could be a change in the incidence and scale of extremes, or it could be a change in variability. I would add a fifth, Georges, and that is a change in patterns of atmospheric circulation. Uh, and those to me are 
above all, how I would see the climate changes of the 14th century, patterns of, of atmospheric circulation around planet Earth change in very profound ways. And let me just illustrate that. Um, these are indices of drought um, um, in the eastern Pacific, in Peru and in California. Uh, and uh, in the middle of the 13th century, um, the, the uh, large parts of the west coast of America, north and south, have mega drought. And you will see that by the end of the 13th century, a far more pluvial conditions have set in, that, that uh, the incident of drought has eased, uh, and then you get an altogether more fluctuating pattern. That The prevailing uh, 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 character of conditions of the 13th century have um, have relaxed. And if you go to the, the other side of the Pacific, and the two sides are teleconnected via the El Nino Southern Oscillation, and we look at um, um, uh, indexes of monsoon rainfall, and the red line is monsoon rainfall over South Asia, um, and you will excuse the crudeness of these lines. These are decadal averages. This is to bring out the trends in a very clear and simple way. And the blue line is monsoon rainfall over Ethiopia, over northeast Africa. Um, and you can see there are profound changes uh, over this 200-year period in the strengths of those two monsoon patterns from um, a very strong South Asian monsoon in the mid-13th century when you have major mega drought uh, in the Americas um, to um, a very weak monsoon in the middle of the 14th century, and I'm very much hoping that Dr. Lee tomorrow is going to tell us a little bit more about what that did to the Yuan dynasty um, in, in, in East Asia, that um, uh, East Asia is grappling with very significant climate change at this time. Um, you will notice that these, these trends are not simple unilineal trends. There is much toing and froing and fluctuation, but there are clearly different climatic episodes unfolding over this period. And, if we can't, uh, and uh, I think my color shadings may not be as clear as uh, I would wish here, but uh, I would detect about five different climate episodes unfolding over that 200-year period. Um, and if we come a little closer to co home and we think about the, the dominant uh, circulation pattern that affects Europe and most places east of Europe, that is the North Atlantic Oscillation, um, uh, what I give here, the red line is a very recent reconstruction on annual basis, but I've averaged it decadally of the North Atlantic Oscillation, and a blue line is precipitation over western Scotland. Um, I'm a Campbell. The Campbells come from the west of Scotland. I now live in the far north of Ireland, which is very close to the west of Scotland. As you will see, the 13th century was very, very wet in Scotland. And then um, precipitation declined dramatically in the second quarter of the 14th century and never recovered back to those 13th century levels. And by 1450, the west of Scotland had become drier and far, far colder. Um, a very significant uh, change there. Uh, and what is happening is the strength and direction of the Atlantic westerlies is shifting. And as they shift south, um, uh, they change rainfall um, over North Africa and into Central Asia, because Central Asia gets most of its moisture uh, from a westerly airstream. Um, so when the westerlies are heading north and west towards Scotland, uh, Morocco and Central Asia have experienced serious drought. And then as the westerlies weaken in the second quarter of the 14th century, you find you get the onset of slightly more pluvial conditions until uh, um, by the last third of the 14th century, Central Asia is getting a much, much higher level of moisture. So they're very significant changes. If you look, just look on that one graph, look at the pattern of those four trends in 1250. And look at the same four trends by 1450. There has been a complete transformation of circulation patterns over that period. Um, so there were very big and significant climate changes unfolding uh, around the Northern Hemisphere and beyond um, over, over these medieval centuries. And in this particular episode, um, in the first half of the 14th century, we, may, we find many of the specific events that have been put under the microscope in our discussions over the last two days. 
the great North European famine of 1315 to 22, the great cattle panzerotic of 1316 to 21, the Tuscan famines of 1328 to 30 and 1346 to 7, um, the terrible um, first bad year um, in Catalonia in 1333, um, and then the only three in a row harvest failure on English medieval record in 1349, 50, and 51. These are, in my experience, the worst English har grain harvest we know of, 1349, 50, 51. They're all coming in the climate context of a weakening North Atlantic oscillation. And as it weakens, it oscillates. Instability increases, as I shall be showing uh, later on. Now, if we think about people, we go to the opposite extreme. We go from the, the physical uh, climate pattern to society, and this is what we are being invited to think about um, in this conference. Um, we know that there are major changes, societal changes over this, this period, not least in terms of the, simply the numbers of human beings um, living uh, in Europe. So this is Jean Biraban's uh, reconstruction of European population trends from the mid-13th century to the mid-15th century with this spectacular collapse in the third quarter of the 14th century. This is Paolo Melanoma's reconstruction of corresponding population trends in central and northern Italy over the same period, where the numbers likewise come crashing down in the 14th century um, uh, uh, and, are, um, uh, and still show no sign of recovering in the middle of the 15th century. And this is an entirely independent reconstruction of population trends in England done by Steve Broadbury and myself quite recently, um, where uh, the English trends track those of Italy fairly closely. So populations are tumbling down in the 14th, in the 14th century, and, not and they will not begin to recover until the end of the 15th century. Um, and if you drive down the number of people, you're driving down um, producers and consumers, so your national income will shrink. And here are three reconstructions of GDP, national income in three economies, uh, Europe's leading economy, Italy, um, um, uh, England, uh, very much a middling economy at that point in time, not nearly as developed as Italy's, uh, and Spain. And uh, you see the Italian economy, as Paolo Nani told us on the very first morning, was already in difficulties. Uh, uh, climate didn't help those difficulties, but Italy's difficulties did not originate with climate. They originated with trade, commerce, and war, and a whole series of societal factors. Italy's economy is contracting be, um, uh, before the mid-14th century, and then, and then it continues to contract to a low point in the 1370s. Um, uh, England's economy doesn't reach its low point until about 1450. Uh, Spain goes down and stays down. So there's a significant contraction in economic output and activity in the three economies for which we currently have estimates. And if you divide GDP by population, you get GDP per head. Um, and in terms of GDP per head, loss of numbers proved to be beneficial for uh, England and Holland, their GDP per head went up. They experienced real economic growth in the second half of the 14th century. And England's economy, this is a point I always like to make, England's economy in the second half of the 14th century grew faster than it is currently growing uh, under the Tory government. Um, and um, George Osborne could learn a thing or two from us medievalists, perhaps. Um, um, the, um, the effects on uh, Italy were more mixed um, uh, you see the Italian Renaissance economy emerging there in the 15th century, but the, the, the growth after the, the Black Death is not as pronounced in Italy. And most interestingly, and I think far from uniquely, um, GDP per head comes down in Spain. This is because Spain is thinly peopled, and if you kill a, a lot of people in a thin, thinly peopled country, you find it very difficult to sustain existing levels of specialization and exchange. Uh, and so, uh, and I think that experience could well be true of significant parts of Scandinavia, uh, the continental interior of Europe, where the thinning out of people is an economic disadvantage, a real economic setback. Um, so, um, my question is, if plague was material, it's clearly Plague is the elephant in the room. If plague was material to the reduction in population and the reduction in economic output, 
was climate change material to the re-emergence of plague? And that's what I want to address in the rest of this lecture. Play, uh, uh, all medievalists accept the, 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 the significance and power of plague in terms of driving population, the importance of population in driving other factors. Um, uh, but most medievalists would not, uh, would not be aware of climate change and would attach little or no importance. They would be dismissive of climate change. Um, uh, they might be less dismissive if one could demonstrate that there is a clear link between climate change, the outbreak of plague, and the impact of that upon the trajectory of European history from the 14th century on. Well, one way of formulating the relationship, the, the teleconnections between environment and society, um, is this statement from David Zhang and others published in 2000, 2011. Climate change was the ultimate cause and climate-driven economic downturn was the direct cause of large-scale human crises in pre-industrial Europe and the Northern Hemisphere. And I bet you almost every single historian of this period would reject that statement because it is a simple, it, it, it postulates a simple bilateral relationship of cause and effect between climate and society. Now, climate of itself does impact upon us. I mean, I find finding it a little hard to, to sleep in Rome. It's much hotter than it is in Donegal at the moment. So, you know, climate has its effects upon us, but most of the time, climate's effects are mediated via other variables. So, in particular, climate's effects on, say, agriculture, is how we often think about them, climate causes harvest failure, that is mediated through ecosystems. Uh, ecosystems contain many components. They contain their own uh, mechanisms and feedbacks. Climate is an input to, the, to those systems, but it's not the only input to those systems. It can change, it can destabilize systems, uh, or the systems can adjust themselves in order to reestablish an equilibrium. So ecosystems are influenced by climate, but they're not determined by climate. Uh, ecosystems contain living things. Plants, animals, marine life, um, uh, uh, microbes. Uh, so that brings us into the world of biology, the biological environment. And I really want to bring that into our discussions at this conference, the importance of the biological environment and the fact that it has its own autonomy. Biolo uh, biological uh, agencies are influenced by climate, but they're not determined by climate. By climate, there are biological processes and factors which to which uh, which will be important in shaping them. Uh, and one of the most important for us are nasty little invisible things called microbes, because they can kill us in vast numbers unless we have evolved immunity to them. So one of the most important relationships in human history is the relationship between humans and microbes. And far more human beings have been killed in Europe by disease than have ever been killed by harvest failure. And when people die during harvest failure, it's typically from um, famine diseases that kill them. The disease is the big enemy, um, far more in Europe historically um, than bad weather and bad harvest. <clears throat> Plague, whatever its origin, constituted a massive and recurrent biological shock. This is the important thing about plague. It, it didn't just come once and go away and allow the population to recover. It came and it returned and it returned and it returned. You go from an era without plague to an era with plague. And then societies and humans had to evolve in an interactive way with plague. Uh, and both learnt to coexist and both learnt to evolve and adapt. Plague, as I said, killed producers and consumers in equal measure. This is why, in my view, um, uh, the Black Death is a more significant biological disaster than the great cattle panzerotic about which Philip Slavin uh, has written so powerfully. It is terribly devastating of bovine populations, but it's not devastating of human populations, so it does not have the corresponding impact that the Black Death does. The Black Death is killing producers and consumers, 
Um, I reckon out of a European population of 80 million on the eve of the plague, about 30 to 36 million Europeans were killed between 1347 and 1353. And in successive outbreaks here captured by um, Jean Biraben's counts of reports of plague outbreaks in Chronicles and by Sam Cohen's counts of wills and testaments, normally deathbed uh, will, wills and testaments, made in nine cities with very good testamentary evidence. You can see how these recurrent plagues in 1360, 61, 1374, 1383, and so forth, plague comes back and back, so that by 1400, about 50 million Europeans have been killed by plague. It is a game changer on a very big scale. And this is Europe. Plague affects Central Asia, Western Asia, the Middle East, North Africa, and Europe. The greater part of the Old World, but significant parts of East Asia are unaffected. This is one of the really interesting and important differences between Easternmost Asia and the rest of Eurasia uh, and North Africa in this period. So what was it? this great killer. And there's been a lot of debate by historians and others as to what it was, and many, including myself, have doubted the traditional diagnosis that this was bubonic plague, Yersinia pestis. And all kinds of alternative uh, explanations have been advanced. Um, but now there is a consensus, and the cons consensus is a very recent consensus, and it's come from research not by historians, but by biologists. They've, uh, we've learned from the men and women in lab coats. Um, and um, the first breakthrough came from the plague research team um, directed by Michel de Lancourt uh, at Marseille. And they published this uh, important paper uh, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, of the USA in, in 2000 where they argued that you could identify the ADNA, the ancient DNA, the signature of plague in the dental pulp of teeth extracted from the victims uh, of, uh, of Black Death, uh, of the Black Death. Um, uh, and um, they claimed that they had found Yersinia pestis uh, in the dental pulp of teeth from a uh, uh, four skeletons just out a uh, cemetery just outside Montpellier in the south of France. Um, and scorn was poured on their results. They were regarded as imprecise. They were dismissed as contaminated. ADNA work, I understand, is very sensitive to contamination. They were unrepresentative. Just because you had plague in the south of France didn't mean to say you got plague in the whole of Europe. There were later plagues which were confined to Marseille and never got any further. It took another 10 years before the definitive biological work had been undertaken, and it was published just as I began my time in Berlin in, Oct in October 2010. It was directed by Barbara Bramanti, who's now based with the, Os uh, the Oslo Plague Team, and this was, of course, undertaken in Germany at Mainz. Uh, and this was done scrupulously, uh, and um, the clinching evidence using the approach of Michel Drancourt, but, use it, but in, uh, applying to it high precision biological methods and techniques, uh, 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 used in, in independently in separate laboratories, uh, is this hugely important uh, paper published in PLOS Pathogens uh, in 2010. Um, and um, they found uh, the, the, the signature of Yersinia pestis in the dental pulp of teeth from skeletons excavated in southern France, Saint Laurent de la Cabrerie, uh, um, in Italy, in Parma and Venice, in southern Germany at Augsburg, uh, at Bergen op Zoom in the Netherlands, and uh, at Hereford in England. And to that has now been e uh, added um, an, a results from. Uh, uh, very well uh, documented burial, Black Death burials in, uh, uh, in London. And they've developed a, a complementary test, a rapid diagnostic test, 
and that has produced complementary results. And most crucially, these results have been obtained in separate laboratories by independent teams of scientists. And all alternative um, diagnoses of what the Black Death was have all faded away. This is now accepted, I think, by everybody that this is, um, this is uh, very, very high quality uh, scientific research has finally established uh, what the plague was. It's what most people had long believed, but, but n increasing numbers of people have begun to doubt. Uh, the diagnosis creates problems for historians because there are many features of the 14th century outbreaks that are a little unlike those of later outbreaks, and there's a, leaves a lot of new, new questions to be answered. Uh, what is it? It's a bacterial infection. It's not a virus, it's a bacterium. It's maintenance hosts, it lives in the wild, um, uh, uh, um, uh, and its maintenance ho uh, hosts are ground uh, burrowing rodents, um, particularly marmots and gerbils. Um, uh, uh, um, and it also affects uh, the kind of rodents who live close to humans, notably rats. Um, so there's a connection between uh, rats and plague, but the, the fundamental maintenance host, it survives in the wild and has survived in the, wi in the wild over the centuries and millennia uh, in these, uh, these uh, maintenance hosts or what people call sylvatic rodents. And it, is, it can be transmitted in many ways, but the, the most widespread and common method is um, by a vector, the bite of a vector, usually a flea, uh, which uh, injects the bacterium by w uh, one method or another into the bloodstream of the victim. The victim is usually another animal. Uh, and uh, this can be done just the way in which humans use uh, needles. Uh, you can do it with a syringe, Okay, uh, a, a flea with a blocked gut injecting the contents of the blocked gut um, into the bloodstream of the victim, or it can be contracted by what my biology friends describe as the dirty needle way of contracting infection. Just the actual effect of biting can in many cases be sufficient to spread the infection. Um, it is usually confined to animals, and only exceptionally does it cross over and infect, infect humans. And it has done so on three uh, major occasions in the three great pandemics, the Justinianic plague, um, first recorded in 540 that devastates the recovering Byzantine Empire, um, at the 1340s, the subject of my talk now, and it will do so again in the third pandemic in the, in the 1850s that spreads from China throughout the world. So uh, there have been um, rising numbers of uh, plague deaths in America. I think there were nine plague deaths in America, human deaths this year, because um, plague has spread to the southwestern United States in this worldwide dissemination of the disease um, at the end of the 19th century. Um, now, simultaneously to um, the biologists uh, um, extracting the, the, the signature of plague from the dental pulp of, plague of Black Death victims excavated by archaeologists, so the critical role of high-quality archaeological investigation here, this is really humiliating for the historians. They have been debating this disease for a long, long time and writing book after book, but the breakthroughs have come from the archaeologists and, and, and the biologists, and particularly uh, uh, from the two working very closely together. And simultaneously, there has been a reconstruction of the, of the Yersinia pestis genome, um, and, um, um, and this was published by a team of 23 biologists um, in 2010. They always say that uh, the difference between a publication by a historian and a biologist is that the biologist will have um, 23 authors and perhaps one to six pages, and the historian will have one author and 23 pages. This is the key difference between the way in which uh, we, we write and, and, and publish. And this produced, this was one of the big challenges to me in Berlin, was to try and understand a phylogenetic tree, uh, which, is, which is what this is. And um, the root uh, 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 is this uh, Yersinia pseudotuberculosis from which Yersinia pestis evolves, and it evolves up here, and it puts off branches. Uh, and the color coding relates to the fact that as the 
genome evolves, it, um, it evolves in slightly different ways in different countries so that it takes on um, sort of natural characteristics, which is very helpful for tracking the spread of the infection. That was um, the first publication of the uh, Yersinia pestis phylogenetic tree in 2010. And it was, it was re, uh, republished and revised in this way by, uh, in this brilliant paper by a, a team of Chinese-led biologists um, published in 2013. This is one of the most important um, articles uh, on Yersinia pestis for us as historians. It's profoundly important and significant, and any historian of this episode uh, um, must uh, grapple with and try and make sense of this article. It's, it's a real breakthrough um, article. I was asked by an English colleague, how did you read it, Bruce? He assumed it was written in Chinese. Um, and I said, well, of course, um, English is the international language of science. And this is one of the great joys and advantages for those of us who are native English speakers. Um, uh, and um, uh, so here's the Yersinia pseudotuberculosis here, and, and it evolves in this way, putting out branches, and uh, with um, radiocarbon dating and historical dating uh, of these genomes identified in these 14th century burials, you can see that the Black Death uh, um, um, uh, genomes are here. And they're at this point, but a whole series of new branches are proliferating. And each of these branches is called a polytomy. Um, and so Cree and others say there's a big bang here. Something is happening biologically at this point um, that is driving um, a whole series of new branches evolving. The, 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 the plague has become reactivated biologically and is, is transforming itself and mutating, putting out these new branches and spreading. So, a, so there's a, a very major biological event is happening just before the Black Death uh, hits the West um, in the late 1340s. Um, well, let me just summarize very quickly what has come out of this, of this genetic work. Um, I have found this literature by far the hardest literature I've ever had to engage with as a historian because um, uh, we all write for our peers, so the biologists are writing for one another. They're not writing for us just as the climate scientists write for one another. They don't write for us. And they all write using acronyms. They write in code. So it's really quite hard work of grappling with this material. They probably find our rather long-winded historical stuff rather hard to grapple with in return. But I found this really quite difficult. But let me summarize what I think it tells us. Um, um, it evolves clonally. So um, the differences between um, the different uh, um, branches of the genome are very small. So these different branches, you should not imagine there are fundamental and profound differences between them. There are very subtle differences um, 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 that require very skilled work to de detect and to plot. So it evolves a clone clonally via a series of small mutations. Uh, fresh branches or fresh polytomies are prone to emerge during major uh, epizootics and panzootics. So when you get new branches suddenly um, proliferating, this is usually because the thing has become very active. Um, almost all of these strains are capable of infecting and killing us humans. So you don't have to have one particular strain to be killed as human. Almost all strains of Yersinia pestis can kill us we become infected um, by any of them. And therefore, there is nothing to suggest, and this is a very clear verdict from the biologists, because there's been a lot of historical speculation on this point, there is nothing to suggest that the genomes responsible for the Black Death were more dangerous than any others. We can't put the Black Death down to a particularly dangerous strain of Yersinia pestis. Um, there is a little bit of uh, AGNA evidence now for the Justinianic plague from two burials in the cemetery Aschheim in Germany. And what is clear is that they are the result of a different crossover, an independent crossover of the, uh, of the pathogen to humans from that which will occur during the second pandemic. So the infection has crossed over from animals to humans in the first pandemic, died away, and a separate and independent crossover has then been responsible for the second pandemic. Um, the plague 
genome embodies its own evolutionary history and pattern of spread. So biologists, by working out the phylogenetic tree, can plot the, the, the evolution and spread of the infection. So it's just as we, are, we have our own DNAs and they carry within, we carry within ourselves our own evolutionary histories, um, and the same applies um, to Yersinia pestis. So this is a new source of information. And the individual strain, strains tend to be country specific. And where plague has existed long, longest, you tend to get the greatest diversity uh, and the presence of the earliest genotypes. Um, and those have enabled the, um, the Kui team to pinpoint the Tibetan Qinghai Plateau of Western China as the ultimate origin of the Black Death. This is where the biological evidence points to this west elevated interior part of Western China as the likely origin from which the, this terrible disease um, uh, uh, gradually erupted at some point in the Middle Ages. This is where it had gone to ground when the first pandemic had spent its force at the end of the 8th century and for which it then re-expanded. <coughs> And um, historically, temporally, <coughs> they, the biologists believe that the genome emerged during this Big Bang event, uh, which they took, think took place sometime after 1268. So at some point in the late 13th, first half of the 14th century, something very significant happened biologically. Coincidentally, of course, with very significant climate changes, coincidentally, of course, with societal changes, and of course, uh, as, uh, 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 as Garrett uh, warned us in his opening remarks, coincidence doesn't mean causation. Well, that's a very important uh, thing to bear in mind. So things are going on coincidentally, but are they or are they not causally connected? That is the really big question. <clears throat> and the key to understanding it, the emergence of this, of this disease, therefore, lies in the region where the biologists think it began, its, uh, its re-emergence, uh, and that is in Arid Central Asia, or ACA for short, <coughs> Arid Central Asia, sometime between the mid-13th and mid-14th centuries. Um, <clears throat> Arid Central Asia, hugely important to the history of the old world in the 13th century. Out of it come first the Mongols, then the great cat or Panzerotic, and then the plague. Thinly peopled area with a big, big historical impact. Well, there's a, a plague cycle. Let me take you quickly through the plague cycle um, because for the plague to spread as the Black Death in Europe and kill 30 to 36 million people, it had to go an un, a, a successive transformations from its, its, its natural state in, in Central Asia. And we can identify four or possibly five stages. The first is when it is basically dormant. It exists as an enzootic, um, um, uh, coexisting uh, with ground-burrowing wild rodents, particularly uh, marmots and gerbils. I don't know how many of you have children and perhaps have marmots and gerbils as pets. You know, they are hosts of plague in the wild. <laughs> Just make sure they don't have any fleas on them. <clears throat> and these animals are relatively tolerant of the pathogen. All, all pathogens, if they're going to coexist with the host, they mustn't kill too many of the hosts, otherwise they cannot survive. So th th there is a, a degree of coexistence. Um, um, uh, and, and a critical vector is, 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 the, is the rat flea uh, shown here. Uh, and it's thus probably that the disease existed for many centuries and would kill perhaps the occasional human who was stupid enough to trap a gerbil at the wrong time and get bitten by a flea, but it's not going to lead to the eruption of a major pandemic. Um, <clears throat> that only begins when the disease becomes more active and becomes an epizootic. And how does that happen? Well, this is where perhaps the weather begins to play a part. We can have set in train what ecologists would call a trophic cascade. If we have more rain, we have more vegetation. <clears throat> 
If we have more vegetation, we can support a larger rodent population. A larger population will carry an increased pathogen load. <clears throat> and the more humid conditions will also stimulate flea activity and the reproduction of fleas. So the flea population will go up and that of itself can generate higher levels of mortality amongst the maintenance hosts, so that the, the stocks of this infection will go up um, uh, if we change the ecological environment within which the, 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 the rodents and the fleas um, exist. <clears throat> if we send that trophic cascade into reverse and we suddenly switch off the pluvial conditions and turn on drought conditions, that increased population of rodents cannot survive. Large numbers will die, and the fleas will need to find an alternative host. And this is when the fleas are most likely to adopt commensal rodents, or rats, typically the rat, bat, black rat, as an alternative. The key thing about black rats is they all live very close to where we live. Um, and when that happens, <clears throat> bites from fleas uh, uh, humans being bitten by fleas can, can result in the transmission of the infection from rats to humans, and that, that's when it becomes a zoonotic. This is an animal infection that has crossed over and is affecting humans. It becomes a zoonotic. That's the fourth stage. <clears throat> then there is a hypothetical fifth stage. Just to illustrate the fourth stage, this, is, this would explain the pattern of plague mortality that we can chart. Uh, the best documented one in the Middle Ages is Givry in Burgundy, um, uh, where there's a very good register of deaths, and where you see uh, a gradual surge to a peak and then a fall back. And, and plagues burn themselves out because eventually uh, the fleas kill off all the rats and the disease cannot be sustained. And that's why you get these flare-ups, burnouts, uh, and until the flea population, the rat population has recovered, you can't have a, have a repeat. The, hypo the hypothesized fifth stage um, involves uh, humans, in effect, becoming hosts, and human ectoparasites, particularly the human flea, Pulex irritans, and possibly the human louse, becoming vectors of plague. And if that happens, of course, then it can spread seemingly as a human-to-human -human infection but involving vectors. And there's a new major research project at the University of Nottingham led by Dr. Steve Atkinson, which is uh, beginning to research the effectiveness of lice uh, as, a, as a transmitter of plague. This would fit the uh, association we see historically between plague outbreaks and harvest shortfalls and potential famine situations when lice are a very important transmitter of typhus. Um, so historically, climatic conditions in arid Central Asia have exercised a powerful influence upon the incidence of plague, either lowering the risk of an outbreak or raising a risk. Um, so it's what's going on in the interior of Eurasia that is partly driving um, whether you are between a, pa um, um, a, a pandemic or in the midst of a pandemic. Now, climate conditions influence plague's behavior in five main ways. Um, ecologically, as I've indicated, they can affect the supply of food to rodent hosts and therefore the density and the survival of host populations. <coughs> and they can also affect the growth of vector, uh, uh, that is to say, flea populations. <coughs> Via temperature and humidity, they will affect the bacterium itself. And, and temperature and humidity together will affect flea reproduction and flea activity. Fleas are very temperature and humidity sensitive creatures. And interactions between the first four factors, uh, how they interact, uh, will also affect plague. They're, all, they're very, very strongly influenced positively and negatively by temperature and humidity. <clears throat> and if we go um, to arid Central Asia, this is Kazakhstan, um, where um, a plague team now based in, in Oslo and led by Nils Christian Stenseth have been doing a lot of work and a lot of work do, using the very excellent records kept 
uh, during Soviet times in this region, uh, measuring uh, plague outbreaks and um, flea loads and so forth. And they have established a clear link between climate, gerbil populations, and outbreaks of Yersinia pestis. Uh, so this is very, very important work at establishing from very good 20th century records that there is a connection between climate, animal populations, insect populations, outbreaks of Yersinia pestis. <clears throat> Under drought conditions, you have poor vegetation, low uh, host populations uh, of gerbils and marmots, and therefore you have enzootic plague. Um, and um, one of the things, uh, I kind of, I nail my climate uh, colors to the mask. I, I think that um, um, solar irradiance has a big influence upon uh, climate certainly in the Northern Hemisphere and the European part of the Northern Hemisphere. And I was um, heartened to read Jörg Lutterbacher's most recent reconstruction of summer temperatures in which he acknowledged that that, that that works to a significant extent. He would accept there are other variables as well, but I was pleased to see that solar radiance was um, you know, getting some, a bit of a thumbs up in that, in that paper. Um, for, a, for a large, for a long interval between the first and second pandemics, you have high solar irradiance, the patterns of atmospheric circulation that that drives, and that creates severe drought in arid Central Asia. And drought um, dampens down plague. This is the long period between the first and second pandemics. It's a period of drought. The big exception uh, is the one that uh, Ronnie Ellenblum uh, has uh, written about, and, and, that, and that's this one here, during the Oort solar minimum here, when you have um, a, a significant relaxation of drought conditions and a, a change in temperature conditions before um, solar irradiance rises uh, and you return to drought conditions. This is a drought index uh, produced by Chen. Uh, and then you get the onset of increasing um, humidity, and you get the onset potential of a trophic, ta trophic cascade that can amplify the activity of plague. Well, we can now uh, hazard a chronology of plague spread across the old world from this source region in western China. It's a very perverse pathogen because it could go east into the thickly settled agricultural lands of China, or it could travel west through desert and mountain and steppe uh, before it reaches Europe. And it's obviously thirsting for European blood much more than Chinese, so it's west that it goes quite extraordinarily through very inhospitable uh, territory, undoubtedly aided and abetted um, by human activity until eventually it reaches the westernmost parts uh, of Eurasia. Um, and as I've indicated, the biological evidence suggests that this reactivation occurred sometime after about 1268, 1282. So it's sometime in the, in the last third of the 13th century that it, the, the, the pathogen gets, uh, gets going. Well, we can now um, bring some sharper evidence to bear on this coming from dendrochronology. So i show you some dendrochronologies. Uh, these are uh, simple ring widths from uh, Siberian pines growing in Mongolia. Um, these are juniper trees in northeastern Tibet, and these are juniper trees in the Tian Shan, a little bit further west uh, from Tibet. And if we just average, uh, this is low-level uh, dendro analysis, George, if we, if we just average those, um, we get this average trend in tree growth, and it picks out the following pattern. There is a pluvial, short pluvial event in the 1250s, there's a significant drought in the early 1270s. There's an even more significant drought in the early 1290s. And then there's this remarkably sustained pluvial event from about 1310 to about 1340, which ends abruptly in another severe drought. And this is when plague re-emerges. This is the environmental context 
uh, in these parts of Central Asia, this alternation between drought and then sustained pluvial and then drought again um, that are possibly um, driving uh, the changes that are taking place. As um, aridity eased, particularly I think from 1310, plague set out on its westward march, um, traversing desert and mountains, uh, until um, possibly we get um, an outbreak at Isik Kul on, on a northern branch of the so-called Silk Road in 1338-9. This is not strongly convincing evidence. This comes from headstones in two excavated cemeteries for which uh, the excavation reports have largely disappeared, so it's unverifiable evidence, but it's, it's been widely cited. It's a straw blowing in the wind, but it's a straw at the right time in the right place. So quite possibly by 1338, um, it's reached Isik Kul, and by this point, it is killing humans. This is the important, the important thing. And it, it gets there, uh, not under its own steam, it, it's piggybacking. Uh, and we heard about camels early on. Camels are clearly important in this um, because um, humans and their goods are moving along here. And here I pick up on a point made a long time ago uh, by William McNeil in his classic study, Plagues and Peoples, the intensification of overland caravan movement across Asia that reached its climax under the Mongol empires affected both macro and micro parasitic patterns in far reaching ways. Okay, here we have the triumvirate climate, disease, and humans acting together and often unwittingly, spreading the disease west. And recorded human uh, fatalities imply that it, the disease has now become at least a zoonotic, that it's crossing over um, from rats to humans. It must by now be affect, infecting rats, and, and from that it must be infecting humans. This is by about 1338. Um, and then um, by the 1340s, it's got as far west as the Caspian Basin, and its movement is accelerating. It's come down onto the plains, it's moving faster, its rate of spread is accelerating once it's got beyond the, 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 the mountainous interior of Asia, and it's crossing into the Caspian Basin, um, into the lands of the Kipchak Khanate uh, of, the, of the Mongol Empire. And plague's accelerating spread mirrored the accelerating pace of climate change. Um, uh, and in my opinion, around about 1340 is a major climatic break point. There's a major climate shift takes place around about 1340. This has come out of a number of the papers at this conference. Uh, and this uh, ratchets up ecological stress. Uh, and we see this in a downturn in tree growth almost everywhere. Um, so here's a tree. It could be an oak, could be a juniper, could be an olive, could stand for any, any tree. Um, this is a pine chronology for Scandinavia. Um, this is another pine chronology for the polar Urals. Um, this is a juniper chron chronology for the Tian Shan in Central Asia. Uh, here's a larch chronology for Mongolia. Another larch chronology for Siberia. Uh, and a macro chronology for 11 chronologies from around planet Earth, northern and southern hemisphere. And what you see there is the only period when all of those chronologies are depressed. There's only one episode when every, the trees almost everywhere are depressed in their growth. And we can date it precisely to 1341 to 54. 1341 to 54. And that 1341 date has been very nicely dropping out of a number of the papers at this conference. And in 1346, we get our first certain historical reference to plague. And this is a translation from Ola Benedicto, uh, important book published in 2004. In the same year, 1346, God's punishment struck the people in the eastern lands, in the town of Ornak, on the estuary of the River Don, in Kastorokan, and in Sarai, and so forth, and other towns in these lands. The mortality was great, so they could not bury them. 
Okay, so this is the outbreak of plague in the lands between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. And um, so I'll just go back very briefly. Look where that is sitting. Okay, uh, I've, I've replotted the master chronology uh, on a slightly, I've exaggerated the y-axis here. Okay, here is our, our dendrochronology trending down a bit here. Here's 1341. Vroom! Down comes the tree growth. Okay. The lowest point is 1347, and the year that we have our first certain reference to plague to the east of the Black Sea is here in 1346. This is a mega environmental shock causing ecological stress, 1340s, and then it begins to recover back. Um, uh, and uh, just to our attention to this one, this is, I'm not going to talk about the 1360s, but that is also dropping out of this chronology. And we have um, a, a consensus of historians um, reporting on plague in this period, um, uh, and we heard about Emperor John VI um, on our first day um, recording events um, in the Byzantine uh, Empire at this time. Um, now, before we do get too monocausal about plague, there were lots of other bad things going on. In 1340, it, when plague got to Europe, the, um, the Crimea, where we first know about it, um, is, of course, in Europe, crossed the Don, got into Europe, 1346. It couldn't have chosen a worse year for point of Europeans. Um, uh, it was a fateful year. A dismal weather was ruining harvest in southern Europe from Catalonia to Tuscany. A Mongol army in 1346 was laying siege to Kaffa, and the Mamluks were poised to capture the final crusader point of Ayas in Cilicia. Um, and meanwhile, there was a debilitating Byzantine civil war, and Ottoman power was in the ascendant. So lots of very important um, uh, uh, political and military shifts taking place at this point in time. Uh, the monopoly grip of the Mamluks on the Indian spice trade was tightening, uh, um, uh, which is one of the reasons the Italian economy was uh, in decline. Uh, the last of the great Florentine banking houses were declared bankrupt in 1346. Um, the English invaded France, and in the old alliance, the Scots invaded England, so there was a tremendous eruption of warfare uh, in northwestern Europe, in which eventually embroiled Spain, Flanders, and the financial fallout of it was felt in Italy. Uh, and warfare on many fronts was escalating, driving up taxes and tolls. And European long-distance com commerce was in advanced decline. So there's a major commercial and financial recession going on, quite independently of plague at this point in time. Plague comes into and alters the equation. And aided and abetted by this combination of economic and ecological stress, plague spreads very swiftly through the trading zones of the the Black Sea, the Mediterranean, and the North Sea. And within six years, it spread right the way throughout this great uh, commercialized trading zone that's linking uh, the, uh, the Middle East and places east of that uh, across uh, central, uh, across the Alps into uh, Flanders, round the uh, Straits of, uh, of Gibraltar, hitting Ireland and England simultaneously before moving ever further north into the colder lands of Scandinavia. Um, <clears throat> uh, and quite possibly by this point, given its speed, it may have crossed over and become a, a, a pandemic spread conceivably by human ectoparasites, the, the human flea and, and human lice. But this is speculation. There is no scientific proof of that as yet. This is one of the big open and interesting questions about it. Now, several different data sets testify to this episode of elevated environmental stress in the early 1340s. Um, and, um, and here, um, I pick up again at a point that Georges made very early on in this conference that environmental change, climate change, may manifest itself in increased or reduced instability. And a simple way of measuring instability is to calculate variance. And this is a calculation of variance of year-on-year -year variation. So this is the vari variance of, of uh, North Atlantic temperatures 
uh, over moving 51-year periods. You see the variance, the year-on-year -year variation of North Atlantic, uh, Northern Hemisphere temperatures is rising um, in the first three quarters of the 14th century, it sinks down and then it rises uh, even more in the 15th century. This is the variance of North Atlantic sea surface temperatures, which has a very big impact upon weather conditions um, um, uh, in Europe and all places east. And you, you see the peak in those sea surface temperatures comes very squarely in the first half of the 14th century and above all in the second quarter of the 14th century. These are the bandwidths of the Scottish speleothem, which has been used to reconstruct rainfall over Western Scotland, um, peaking um, in the second quarter of the 14th century. These are coming largely from independent data sets, so it's when different data sets, different paleoproxies are telling a similar story, we can be begin to believe the story. Um, these are British Isles oaks. Um, uh, which have a, a peak of variability uh, in the late 1340s. And this is the one, my own little modest contribution. These are English crop yields from written historical documents, the variance of year on year, uh, a variance of, 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 of grain yields. If we average those, that is the average trend. And I would call that an index of environmental instability. And this is one of my uh, uh, small heroes is Martin Schaeffer, uh, um, Critical Transitions in Nature and Society, a wonderfully inspiring book in terms of helping us think about what is going on here. Variance in fluctuations may often increase as a critical transition is approached. And you see the variance is going up and you're reaching a critical transition in the 1340s. It is the critical decade when things tilt. <clears throat> so let me draw this to a close and offer some conclusions that sum up what I've been trying to uh, argue uh, from my reading of the work mainly of other scholars. Um, uh, the Black Death, I think, is a clear case of the teleconnections that existed between environment and society. And what we see here is change cascading through the old world socio-ecological system in complex and unpredictable ways and with transformative results. And I use in my book, I use this term, the, 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 the socio-ecological socio complex or the socio-ecological system. Humans are part of this system which has uh, important in, uh, ecological dimensions. And the change is complex. There are all kinds of feedback mechanisms and dead ends and so forth. This is not anything that is simple. It is something complex. And I like this idea of it sort of change cascading, uh, sometimes accelerating, sometimes slowing, sometimes reversing, and then taking a new direction. Um, Plague's biological reactivation from a dormant state to a more virulent epizootic state occurred in the heart, in the deep in the interior uh, of the Eurasian landmass in arid Central Asia. Uh, this thinly peopled region that has a colossal impact on the histories of all regions around it. Um, and it happened sometime in the late 13th and early 14th century under conditions of mounting ecological stress. And that stress, I believe, was generated by the alternation of drought and pluvial events as global patterns of atmospheric circulation destabilized and changed. That, I think, is what is going on. There's a macro picture, okay? Macro picture doesn't make a huge difference most of the time until it flips what is going on biologically. It's flicking that biological switch that has the really big historical consequence. Plague's subsequent crossover from sylvatic rodent maintenance host to amplifying commensal rodent hosts and its wholesale transmission to humans as the zoonotic um, then occurred, I think, most probably during the marked climatic and environmental anomaly of the 1340s. So this is the critical decade when there's a very major stress from a whole series of sources, and this is when plague erupts from Central Asia, West, and throughout Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East, 
uh, with profound long-term consequences, which I hinted at um, at the beginning of this talk. The fate of medieval Europeans, therefore, was intimately bound up with environmental developments taking place 6,000 kilometers to the east in the semi-arid and sparsely populated interior of Central Asia. And Gerrit and Martin, if that is not a teleconnection, perhaps you might tell me what it is. Thank you.